Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, presenting from here in our uh, broadcast studios on Com Ave is two-time Terrier alumna, Sharon O'Connor. Sharon is a management consultant, developmental psychologist, and founding partner of EKS Consulting Group. She specializes in working with C-suite professionals, helping them to become extraordinary leaders who manage effectively, inspire their people to go above and beyond, and drive in a Throughout her career, Sharon has worked with executives and teams at all levels of Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, and startups. At FAS Consulting Group, Sharon works with her two partners, Karen Hoffman and Dale Chakaloff, to strengthen leadership through executive coaching and facilitating organizational systems. Sharon has also been uh, an amazing resource to the BU alumni community, Sharon is actually the BU, BU alumni, uh, through various speaking engagements over the last couple of years. And we're really lucky to have her as a, a valuable volunteer for the career programming team. Sharon, thank you so much for being here again today. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Do you want to go ahead and make sure that you um, can hear me and I can hear you? Hi there, Jeff. Thanks so much for inviting me back and for letting me give this webinar. Managing Difficult Personalities and the Unconventional Wisdom, Oprah, Gandhi, and Kermit the Frog. Um, it's just such an honor to be here today to share with you all what I've learned about conflict and managing difficult personalities. Can you hear me? Yes, sounds great. Great. Yes, okay, I great. thought it would be great if we started with an anonymous poll so I could get a sense of... Um, who you all are out there and some of the problems that you might be facing. So Jeff, could we um, start with a little bit of a poll? Okay, thanks, thanks so much. So um, the first question is, what is your current role? And I'm gonna read through the choices at the CEO, executive director, or managing partner level, or you're at the C-suite, senior VP, senior executive level, you're at the VP senior manager level, manager director level, supervisor level, or other. So if you all could just um, share with me what level that you're at, this is completely anonymous. Um, that would be great. Sure, we've got a, a decent part of the group that's answered, so I'm gonna go ahead and end okay. that. And, um, and then the second the question. question. Um, that's great. Well, here's the Thanks so much. Those are the results from the first question. Thanks so much. Um, and if we could um, close out that and go to the next poll question, that'd be great. Okay. So which conflict challenge best describes what you're facing? Um, your subordinates are bickering and in conflict. You are experiencing conflict with peer or peers. You have a conflict with a superior. Organizational conflict between groups. Serious conflict that stops short of legal action. For instance, some types of bullying falls into this. Um, very serious conflict that gives rise to legal action. Uh, sexual harassment would be uh, an example of that. Or other. So if you could just take a moment and describe uh, the conflict that you're facing, that would be very helpful. Okay, Jeff, thanks so much. Seems like organizational conflict between groups is what most of you are experiencing. There's a conflict across the board. All right, Jeff, thanks so much. So, when your management team can't work together, it gets in the way of productivity, creativity, and morale. This webinar is gonna offer you unconventional wisdom from our favorite leadership rock stars, Oprah, Gandhi, and Kermit the Frog, as well as real life strategies for resolving conflict and building collaboration. I hope that you will gain a little insight as to why people act in the ways that create conflict, as well as how to move beyond the hostility so you can inspire higher levels of performance from your team. So, 
what is conflict? Have you ever been in this type of situation? Your chief technology officer has all kinds of good ideas for new products, but your chief financial officer never thinks any of them are good ideas, and there's always a reason. They're too expensive, they don't align with the business plan, whatever. And they go at it. Your CTO wants to innovate and sell more products, and your CFO wants to save money and cut resources to improve the bottom line for investors. It's at this point that they both come to the conclusion that that guy is a difficult person and wrong, and I am a good person and right. They label each other as the problem, which serves to block out creative solutions and keeps them stuck in a whirlpool of animosity. And not only do they disagree heatedly between themselves, but they bring their animosity to your leadership team meetings and it ripples out to impact everyone on the team. Both people end up in your office complaining about how difficult the other one is. This is a pretty common conflict. So let's take a look at this. Why is there conflict in the workplace and how can we resolve it? Conflict falls on a continuum. There's conflict on any team. There's a natural tension between departments and normal disagreements occur naturally on a team. There's also healthy, challenging, but respectful conflict that helps a team succeed. That's the sweet spot of conflict that's productive. And then there's conflict that keeps people stuck. That is the conflict that we wanna to talk to you about today. I'm not gonna address the kind of conflict that gives rise to legal action, although we do deal with those kind of issues in our business. But today, we're gonna to talk about that intense disagreements, bickering, and the kind of conflict that interferes with productivity. After more than a decade of consulting to C-suite executives like yourselves and addressing conflict situations that you face, I often find that people, one, want the other party to change, Two, they find themselves in a position where they have to choose sides, creating a win-lose situation. Or three, they label someone as just plain difficult, like the story I just told you. What I have learned is that these responses keep people stuck and teams stuck in conflict. In this webinar, I'm gonna share with you how to move beyond conflict into a new way of operating. And I've chosen three inspirational rock stars, Oprah, Gandhi, and Kermit, to illustrate how conflict can be resolved and we can move forward and thrive at work. When we're in conflict, we often think that we've been wrong. So we feel angry and hostile. And I've said, as I've said before, we can tend to hyper-focus on all the ways in which we are right and the other person's wrong. We get locked into the negative tug of war of the differences and disagreements, and this mindset keeps the flames of conflict flourishing. Check out this cartoon to see what I'm talking about. So how do we turn down the fiery emotional temperature and begin to move through the anger and disagreement? Let's ask Oprah. At the 2018 Golden Globe Awards, Oprah talked about racism and sexism, about sexual assault and sexual harassment in the entertainment industry that gave rise to the Me Too movement. And here is a short clip of what she said. Oops. We're gonna click on it. Oops. We're gonna let me see if I can just get this going. Sorry. I've interviewed and portrayed people who've withstood some of the ugliest things life can throw at you. But the one quality all of them seem to share is an ability to maintain hope for a brighter morning, even during our darkest nights. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. And when that new day finally dawns, it 
will be because of a lot of magnificent women, many of whom are right here in this room tonight, and some pretty phenomenal men fighting hard to make sure that they become the leaders who take us to the time when nobody ever has to say, me too, again. Okay. In this moving and inspiring speech, Oprah talked about perseverance, about hope, about the possibility for moving forward from the conflict and hostility of Me Too to something better, something positive. Her speech was brilliant in that it, it, it acknowledged and validated the reasons for the conflict and the anger. But then, she shifted to create a vision of possibility for moving beyond the state of conflict. When we work with managers and teams who are stuck in a pattern of hostility, we use the same strategy that Oprah so eloquently demonstrated. We try to shift their mindset from their locked in disagreement to a new focus on positive solutions. Let me share with you a story that illustrates how focusing on a vision of possibility can shift a team away from high conflict and toward teamwork. We were working with the head of a Boston restaurant chains whose two top performers, Sean and Jim, were in a very serious conflict situation. They'd been close friends, but Sean, the head of sales, had a drinking problem that was getting worse. Now this next part may sound like a soap opera, but it's a true story. Jim, the head of marketing, was having an affair with Jill, one of Sean's subordinates. And Jim had shared this fact in confidence with Sean. Fast forward now to the end of the week at their usual Friday get together at a local bar. Sean has been overserved and he's stumbling around the bar making a fool of himself. And Jim teased Sean on his excessive drinking in front of their coworkers. And in return, Sean outed the affair. This was personal and violated a friendship that caused the most entrenched conflict we have ever seen. They refused to speak with one another. They began sabotaging each other's work and the hostility trickled down to the entire office. The problem for the CEO was that he didn't want to fire either of them. He called us in to work with both Sean and Jim as well as the entire office. And like Oprah, we validated their feelings of hurt and betrayal. This step is critical and cannot be skipped. You must acknowledge the bad behavior and validate the hurt feelings. Then we coached the CEO as part of the intervention to come up with an inspirational project that everyone could be a part of and feel moved by. You probably remember the Boston Marathon bombing, which took place in the neighborhood where this restaurant was located in the Back Bay. The CEO of the restaurant chain decided to host an event to honor the first responders. This was just the thing to move these two beyond their own pain and to inspire, to inspire them to work together for a greater purpose. Their relationship was never the same but they were able to work together with each other again. So the strategy of validating and pointing to possibility is a powerful and effective way to move through conflict. But there's another important element here that we learned from Gandhi. There really is no more inspirational leader when it comes to dealing with difficult people and resolving conflict than Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, Here's a little Boston University trivia for you. The BU Howard Thurman Center, whose mission it is to bridge divisiveness through inclusion and connection for BU students, was grounded in the philosophy of Gandhi. So let's learn a little more. You probably remember that Gandhi led the people of India in their quest for independence from their British colonists and through those first difficult years as a new nation. But what you may not know is that he used empathy for his adversaries as the primary tool for resolving differences. And despite the intense efforts of his enemies to discredit him in the eyes of his followers, 
He was unwavering in his teaching that we must love our enemies. Gandhi's greatest challenge, however, came after India won its independence from Great Britain as fighting broke out between the dominant Hindu members of the country and their fellow citizens who were Muslim. And until his dying day, he worked to bring peace between these two groups. There's a famous story that is emblematic of how intensely Gandhi believed that empathy would be the power that would bring these two groups together. During the height of the violence between the Hindus and the Muslims, Gandhi's confronted by a distraught Hindu man who confesses that while enraged over the death of his young son at the hands of Muslims, that he killed a young Muslim boy himself. Gandhi tells the man that he can achieve forgiveness one way. He must find a young boy whose own parents have been killed and raise the boy as his own. But the boy must be a Muslim and the man must raise him as one. Gandhi understood that by putting oneself in the shoes of one's enemy and walking as such, that empathy will build a more peaceful and just resolution to conflict that will carry the day. So let me share with you a story of how one act of true empathy flipped a highly charged conflict situation that we were involved with on its head. We were coaching the president of a leading division of a profitable mid-sized retail company. Kathy had always been a rock star. In fact, she was responsible for turning a failing division into one of the company's major assets. But over the past year, Kathy struggled with managing her temper. She was getting into repeated conflicts with her VP of sales about her sales targets, fighting with her finance manager over budgeting, and she even had a very public temp temper tantrum where she walked out of a staff meeting. The CEO had spoken to her about this, attempting to be supportive, but the situation only seemed to get worse. And we were brought in when one of her subordinates filed a formal complaint with HR that Kathy was bullying her. We were so curious as to how this high-performing senior executive had morphed into a bully. After many weeks of coaching and gaining Kathy's trust, we learned that one year earlier, she discovered that a highly regarded and long-term trusted employee had been cooking the books and a large sum of money was stolen and Kathy had missed it. And at that same time, quite coincidentally, the VP of HR, who'd been a close friend of Kathy's up to that point, had some personal issues, and that led her to step back from their friendship. So now Kathy believed that she was being held responsible for the financial loss and that the vice president of HR was backing away from her because of that mistake. As a result, Kathy ramped up her attention to the fine details of everyone else's work and became irate at the first sign of mistake. It took a while, but an empathy strategy emerged that turned this whole situation around. When we had had a clear sense of what had happened, we presented the information to the VP of HR and the CEO, and they immediately became empathetic. Suddenly, they understood that Kathy's confidence had been shaken by the major infraction that she missed, and her anxiety had been made worse because her friend in HR had backed away from their friendship. When the VP of HR saw this situation from Kathy's point of view, she knew exactly what to do. She invited her old friend to go out to coffee, and there she apologized to Kathy for her behavior following the incident and told her that it had nothing to do with her confidence and her and Kathy's ability to do the job. She reminded Kathy of all her successes and how important that she was to the company and how, how much Kathy's friendship had meant to her. I will tell you that this act of empathy turned everything around. Kathy calmed down. She shifted back to trusting her staff more, and then they in turn became less antagonistic. There were no more temper tantrums, no more complaints to HR. This simple but powerful act of empathy on the part of the VP of HR changed 
everything around for this president. And they've remained positive and productive collaborators ever since. And there's one more point that I want to share. And for that, we turn to Kermit the Frog. So far, I've shared with you the conflict resolution wisdom of both Oprah and Gandhi, two iconic rock star peacemakers. However, we understand that because these two are such major league VIPs, it might make their strategy seem a bit out of reach for some of us. But we believe there are also role models all around us in our everyday lives for dealing with people in difficult situations. That they could be that charismatic customer service rep in your sales department who can magically calm a cranky customer. Or that talented director in finance who created such a strong and cohesive team that conflict gets resolved quickly and you never have to deal with it. Or you can even find a role model of conflict resolution in that familiar green Muppet frog who uses a big tent inclusive approach to solving conflict where everybody's a part of the team, everybody has a role to play, and everybody's important. Let's take a minute and watch this clip of Kermit the Frog wrangling a noisy group of competing monsters, greasers, and doodlebugs to see what I mean. Yo, frog! Like he says, yo! You wanna go for a vroom vroom frog? Hey, shall we take the vroom vroom vroom? What do you say, Veronica? Am I alright, alright? You guys back there are going yup, yup, yup. You guys are going twill, 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 and you guys are going vroom, 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 and I am going body. Yep, 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 yep. So listen, as long as we're all here at once, why don't we just try to get along with each other? What do we do? Well, we just turn all that noise that you're making into music. Radical. Thank you. Uh, Martians, you might do this. Yup, 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 yup. Yup, 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 yup. Excellent. And Twiddlebugs, are you there? Right under the dandelion. Okay, you do this. Tweedlebug. 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 Very nice. Okay, and, and you guys, what you do is you just sort of sing about what we're going to do here. Uh, I forgot. What's that? Well, we're going to get along with each other. So sing this. Get along. Get, get along. along. Okay. Now, all together in the spirit of harmonious cooperation. Yup, 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 yup. Okay, masterful conflict resolution, don't you agree? The psychological strategy that underlies Kermit's brilliant dispute resolution technique is what we call finding common ground. And here are three ways that you can find common ground. One is to find a common goal to rally around. Or two, to find common experiences that helps people connect. Or three, find common qualities or values that we can all share. All three of these strategies seek to elevate the participants out of the black and white thinking of those guys are bad and us guys are good, to put their attention to a place where we're all on the same team. Finding common ground creates a mindset shift and it can immediately create connection and lower the volume of conflict so problems can get solved. Let's get back to Kermit and break it down so you can see exactly how he uses the strategy of finding common ground by finding a common goal. First, he pulled everyone together. He didn't individually go to each group and try and get them to shut up, change their behavior, or tell them that they should wait their turn or any of that. He said, listen up, we're all going to do something together here. Next, he assigned them all different roles. And what is kind of super brilliant is that he assigned the roles based on their strengths. He said, you aliens over there, you go yip, yip, yip. And you doodlebugs, you sing doodlebug, doodlebug. Kermit gave them different but important roles that contributed to the whole. And lastly, he had them focus 
on the common goal of creating music and singing a song. Kermit helped this noisy group of rivaling Muppets shift their focus and behavior out of competing for his attention by working towards a common goal. Rallying around a common goal is one of the most effective ways to find common ground and turn down the volume of a dispute. Let me share with you one of our stories of finding common ground through finding a common goal. We were recently working with the CEO of a large tech company that was going through a long drawn out merger and folks in the organization were understandably worried about their jobs. And when people are worried, they can become difficult to work with. His direct team began blaming each other for small mistakes, withholding information, and even worse, they began trashing each other outside the organization. At first, this CEO talked to each of his direct reports individually and basically told them to cut it out. And when this didn't work, he pulled them all together and tried to reason with them giving them the facts of the situation so that they could be fully informed. This helped somewhat, but still the toxic behaviors continued. He asked for our help in managing the situation, and we suggested that he find a real common goal that they could all focus on immediately and where they would have to work together to get it done. So he scheduled a trip to Washington, D.C., where his team would meet with members of Congress to share how the upcoming legislation on net neutrality was gonna impact their company. This common goal created a situation that forced his staff to work together. And not surprisingly, the difficult behaviors decreased significantly. But what our CEO, CEO did not expect was that their new camaraderie lasted beyond the duration of the project. They shifted their mindset from feeling isolated and worried to feeling great about being part of a team that had accomplished an important goal. So finding a common goal can shift the mindset of individuals, teams, and organizations out of conflict and into cooperation. Another way to find common ground is by focusing on common experiences. We worked with the CEO and her staff of a hospital system that was growing as well as trying to respond to rapid changes in the healthcare industry. Folks were so busy putting out fires and trying to respond to market demands that they were not making time to connect in any meaningful way. And conflict arose out of role confusion, lack of information sharing, and just the sheer volume of work. We suggested to the CEO that she and her staff take a time out retreat where we would facilitate a team building session. So they blocked out two hours one morning and we facilitated a, a workshop that focused on their common experience of being in this stressful work situation. This exercise helped them reorient their mindset to one where they realized this is hard for all of us and we are all on the same team here. This mindset allowed them to problem solve together how to improve their situation. They were able to come up with a bunch of proactive strategies like crafting a mission, vision, and values that pulled them out of the firefighting mode and into the leadership mode. So finding common experience builds rapport and connection, which in turn decreases conflict. And there's a third way that we can help organizations find common ground and that is through common qualities or values. We were working with an alternative energy startup that, that was having some growing pains and the people were stressed. The CEO contacted us because one of the most valuable members of his staff, his chief information officer, seemed to be starting fights with everyone, including him. We decided that we could help the CEO with both the growing pains and the difficult employee by helping them find something in common that they all cared about at the company. After much discussion, they discovered that the thing they cared about in common was a value they called, everyone's role matters. We worked with them to define what exactly that meant. What behaviors demonstrate that everyone's role matters? 
And then how can they reward those behaviors when they saw them? Here's how it played out. They decided that expressing appreciation for one another for the work that they do was a behavior that demonstrated everyone's role matters. The CEO led the way by putting little thank you notes on employees' desk, desks when he noticed even small jobs done well. This began to spread. And lo and behold, people started saying thank you to one, an one another. A lot including to the grumpy CIO. An actor receiving several thank you messages from different people in the organization, including the CEO, the CIO's antagonistic behavior decreased. He was still prickly, but he stopped being in attack mode all the time. Just like Kermit, when the CEO led the charge of finding common qualities and values, people became more aligned and in turn had fewer disputes. And of course, when all else fails with that one employee who really just insists on being difficult, there's always this solution. I'll give you a second to read it. <laughs> Actually, just being funny here, but seriously, conflict is hard any way you slice it. It's so easy to get caught up in the hostility whirlpool. And sometimes it's worthwhile and actually more effective to have professionals who are outside the situation, like us, come in and manage the situation. But right now, let's review the strategies that we've shared. The first is validate, then point to a new direction. Point P, validate the issue and then point them in an exciting new direction. And then the second strategy is to model empathy. Help them see things through the other's eyes. And when you model empathy, it helps them access their own ability to be empathetic. And the third is to find common ground through common goals, common experiences, or common qualities, or any point of connection that they share where you can build upon a solution. And finally, here's a bonus tip for all of you hanging in there with me to the end of this webinar. And it's one of the most important themes that runs through all of these examples. We need to elevate folks in conflict to shift their mindset out of labeling you are bad to you are behaving badly right now, but it's just behavior. It's not who you are. And you have the capacity to exhibit more productive behavior. So we can all do better here. So that's the end of the slideshow part of the webinar, and thank you so much for allowing me to share with you a little bit about conflict and managing difficult people. And I'd like to um, open it up to questions at this point, Jeff, if that's okay. Sure, sure. That was great. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. And, uh, thank you to everybody who, who noticed that there's a bit of a feedback lag. So apologize for that. We do have one question that came in. You talked about this a little bit at the beginning of your presentation, but our guest was wondering if you sort of talk about how to handle the situation where um, alcohol and substance abuse in the workplace are, are causing problems where, you know, this person asked a question about um, that problem was preventing their knowledge from acting on the So how would you begin to sort of break that problem down? Well, you know, we have addressed this particular issue um, several times as a business. So that's something that we have um, some familiar with. So I think you have to separate the behavior from the person, okay? And you have to validate the concern. So that's specific advice that I would give. You separate the behavior from the person and you validate the concern. Um, it is a difficult issue and um, 
it's one that um, needs to be addressed. And you know, it, it depends on the level of degree that it's impacting their productivity as well. Sure. sure. Um, yeah, I think it's the same person said it's difficult, especially when it's the boss. Um, another question came Yes, in. That's, that's a particularly difficult <laughs> issue that, I mean, um, you know, people need to seek out resources uh, to be able to help the situation. It's not something that I think that, especially if it's the boss, that um, a person should uh, approach themselves. That would be the advice I would give. <laughs> Reminders, everybody, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. I, I see a couple of folks who are making questions in the chat. Um, we can answer them there, but it'll be a lot easier to uh, use the Q&A box. So um, another question, is conflict resolution different between private government and non providers? Any different approaches that you would suggest for government workplaces? Well, you know, honestly, um, we've found that people are people and that it really, um, you know, we do adjust our approach based on the folks, but I haven't noticed the um, conflict resolution um, approaches being any different based on whether it's nonprofit, for profit, or government. Um, you know, everyone needs to be individualized in their conflict. Um, you may have, we've worked in organizations where. There's two different approaches that we take within the same kind of organization. So it really depends on what the conflict is and who the people are as to how you would approach the conflict. And I think, as I said earlier, conflict falls in a continuum um, depending on what the, um, you know, what the company is dealing with, I think depends on how you'd approach the conflict. If you're in a place where you're seriously stuck, and you've tried several approaches, um, my suggestion would be, again, to seek outside resources to help. There's some great questions coming in here from, from our alumni. The last that you all share with me, I know there's some other speakers. Um, great question from Leilani. Can you address the difference between um, conflicts with Gen X and Gen Y versus millennials, the different generational sort of cultures, um, you know, feeling like specific, specific generations need special attention to their feelings. So does your approach on conflict resolution vary at all by generational? Um, you know, our, our go-to is empathy. Okay, so that's the number one go-to approach that we take is that we try and understand and walk in the shoes of where each person is. It doesn't really matter what age they're at, is that if you can get in a place where you can understand where they're coming from, you're going to better able to be, to address the approach. I don't really like labeling people in terms of buckets like millennials or um, Gen X, I, I really like to take each individual as who they are as individuals and use empathy as a way to understand them more. Um, there is age differences that are, um, that you may approach them in a different, in a different way. You may you know, treat people who are um, from a different generation with different language. So you use rapport as a way to understand what, how to approach them. So, you know, we look at what we have in common. We try and find common ground and also use empathy to try and understand them more. You know, this is really more of an exercise in listening, really careful listening. And through that listening, can you find a place of common ground to start and build from there? So I guess that's, that's my approach with all these different age groups is um, not to label them so much, but to really find, use your empathy to find common ground. Uh, great question from Beija. Beija. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. What do you do when a leader doesn't manage conflicts and just allows different competing groups to continue to compete? compete? That, that, I have seen leaders use that as a strategy, as a leadership strategy. Um, it's very common. We've seen it a lot. Um, at this point, what I would 
say to you is to really understand what you have control over and what you don't. Okay? Be very clear. You can only control yourself. You cannot control your manager. You cannot control anyone else. You can only control yourself. So what, coming from a point of understanding that you can, under, you can only control yourself, understand that you can control your responses to people around you. They don't have control over you. You have control over yourself. So it's coming from that viewpoint is that you can only control yourself, and that's actually a lot. You can have quite a bit of an impact coming from that perspective that um, that, that may shift your mindset out of it's uh, I can't do anything because he's creating this conflict situation. But I can I actually have a lot of control because I can control myself and I can make different choices based on that understanding. I'm paraphrasing the question from Wong, but sort of taking it a step further, even if you're really trying to utilize empathy and, and sort of understand people that you're in a conflict with, what if you still can't reach any kind of common ground? What, what do you do that? Um, I, I do think that um, sometimes there are situations that are really, really difficult, but I don't, I have never had a situation where we couldn't help turn the volume down um, of the conflict situation. S sometimes it requires a third party, a neutral third party to step in to help facilitate a conversation so that everyone can feel heard. So I think if you've tried everything, you've used empathy, you've tried to find common ground, the next strategy that I would suggest is to find a neutral third party to facilitate a conversation so people can get heard. Sometimes that's, that's a more effective way to um, come to an understanding, to decrease the conflict. And the, another point I want to make, and I've mentioned this earlier, is that um, conflict can be productive. There's a sweet spot of conflict. Um, we don't want to totally erase conflict in the workplace. What we want it to be is respectful. We want there to be differences of opinion. We want there to be differences of ways of approaching things. Um, that's, that contributes to creativity. It contributes to so much that's good in the workplace. But it has to be in a way where people feel heard and respected. So... That's my two cents on that. <laughs> um, Ali or Ali has asked a question, any wisdom on dealing with an incompetent boss in a government context? Um, I would ask, can you elaborate on that question a little bit more? Give us a little more detail about the relationship between the boss instead of just, uh, it's, I think it would be hard for Sharon to answer just based on incompetence. So, so Ali or Ali, if you want to elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, Sharon, a question uh, from the university or college field, I'm guessing, hopefully it's not be you, but how do you handle an angry and confrontational supervisee? This person is a tenured faculty member. So obviously, faculty members with tenure have a very different relationship with their employer. Um, how do you handle the handling where that person is unwilling to meet with you or come to any, to any compromise? So, uh, say it again one more time, just so that I understand. It's what you say. So this the person who's asking the question ha is supervising a tenured faculty member and feels that this person is unwilling to meet with them or come to any type of compromise. How would you begin to tackle that challenge? It's extraordinarily difficult. I have to first validate that that is a really, really difficult, um, uh, very, very difficult management challenge. Um, in situations like that, I would say, what is your goal? What is your goal? Okay, and continue to focus on what is your goal and try and understand what that other person cares about and frame what you want um, to have happen in the context of what they care about. Okay, so if that other person cares about, you know, say time off, say that's something that they care about, some employees care about, you know, publishing or time off or something like that, then frame what you have to offer in terms of what they care about, how you can help them publish, how you can help them with, you know, whatever it is that they need to um, need help with. So in terms of building relationship, 
in order to manage conflict with someone, you got to help use empathy to understand what they care about and move from there. Because then you have a place of common ground to work from. Okay, the common ground is what this person cares about. And then you frame your solution in terms of how you can help them get what they want. How does that sound? Great. Uh, question for question. Me. What are your thoughts on self assessments, such as the Thomas Jefferson conflict mode instrument to measure a person's natural approach to handling conflict? Are you familiar with that assessment, the Thomas Kilman conflict mode? I'm not familiar with that one. I'm not familiar with that. And it's probably because I don't really use um, assessments. I use. Um, you know, every, everything we do is really tailored to each individual um, situation. Some folks find assessments useful, and I think that um, if you find them useful, go for it. Um, I just don't happen to use um, assessments. There's, there's one group of assessments that I think about that may be helpful to folks um, who like assessments, and that is um, from the world of positive psychology. So all our consulting, all our philosophy of how we approach conflict resolution is grounded in positive psychology. And that's the kind of psychology that's, um, it's, it's fairly new in the past 10 years. And it's based on the belief that we want to look at how people thrive and increase those elements that help folks thrive. And um, it's really based on how to build upon people's strengths versus um, typical you know, psychology, which is based on the medical model, which looks at all the ways in which you're sick. <laughs> so positive psychology has taken that, turned it on its head, and it, sa it says, let's look at all the ways in which people uh, are strong and build upon those. And the assessments that come from that world of positive psychology, I think it's um, UPenn. So University of Pennsylvania has some on their website. So if you Google positive psychology assessments, there's one called Values in Action, and there's a whole bunch of others. Those are the kind of assessments I'll point people to who really like to use assessments. So, but otherwise, when, you know, I work with folks, I, I tend not to use them unless they really, really are interested in them. And all this stuff applies to conflict resolution, because you want to build upon your strengths to focus on conflict resolution. And, and so that's how, um, if we look back at the webinar, that's how Kermit did it. So Kermit, he looked at what those monsters could do well, um, and he used their strengths as a way to contribute to the to the whole and that's how we work with groups We look at what you're strong at we look at what strengths you have as a way to focus on working together better and um, We found that that's a much more effective approach to resolving conflict Rather than trying to tell people to cut it out that that doesn't that doesn't work so well so That's a perfect segue to another question um, uh, yeah, the person's asking, we have a restaurant with 32 employees, cell phones have become a major issue among some of our staff. No matter how many calls we implement, there are always some who hide out and use their phones when they should be focusing on something else. What's the best way to approach the entire staff of 32 to let them know that cell phones are a problem and behavior will not be tolerated? So, you know, you, you have to reward positive behavior. So when folks are not using their cell phones, you have to notice and reward that. Thank you so much for you know coming in today and saying hi to everyone instead of going right to your right to your cell phone. I think our our approach is to notice when people are doing things right and to reward that and to notice that and to do more and more and more of that. Um, because as you found out, punishing people for doing things wrong tend to subvert the behavior and they go and they go underground. So if you create a situation where you get rewarded for not having a cell phone and the reward can be social, it can be economic, there can be all kinds of rewards, but be creative, have your staff come up with those kind of rewards that would be meaningful to them. Um, 
and then reward that. Notice when people are doing the right thing. You will get so much more, uh, cover so much more ground when you do things like that versus punishing them when they're not doing things right. We got some uh, clarity on the situation from Ali, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase again here. Ali or Ali. Um, uh, this is the person who is the government, and long story short, really running up against just some government bureaucracy. I mean, like senior appointments are being made for wrong reasons. Everything's tied up just in politics. So, how do you begin to break down that kind of conflict where it's really just really massive bureaucracy, political decisions being made as opposed to the right decisions? Any any comments on that, Sharon? Oh boy, <laughs> um, I, that to me feels like it falls outside the framework of conflict and. Um, you know what conflict is I, I do feel for this person though because it is really really tough to be in situations where um, politics is what gets you know get you elevated versus good performance and that can be the nature of um, not just government organizations but that can be the nature of just any organization so um, yeah I think you have to it's an organizational challenge and you have to focus on what people care about in order to move forward. If you're, you know, trying to move within the organization, if you can identify what that person cares about and tune into that and help them get that, then you're going to have it um, a much more smooth time versus wishing that they cared about something else. Um, I think I found the perfect question for us to end on because in chatting before your presentation and your colleagues sort of predicted that we'd get this question. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, it, it, it's been showing empathy. You've been trying to show understanding. At what point do you realize that maybe it's time to move on from your current position? <laughs> um, that's an excellent, excellent question. Um, I think that. Um, if you've tried everything and you are you've been at it for a while and you don't feel like this is going to change and that you are not thriving at work then I think that's the point where you need to decide um, this isn't working for me any longer uh, it's time to move on and you know the best kind of work situation is where you can use your best skills and strengths so that um, you can thrive. And if you're not able to use the, your best skills and strengths, then I would say if, if you can't use them at that place in, of employment, that there's other places that would be desperate for you and that would want you. And so start looking outside. Karen, thanks so much for uh, sharing your expertise today. We've got a couple of people chiming in here to say thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, you're welcome. You've been such a great. Uh, advocate for our alumni. You've been sharing your expertise for all these years with me now. So I just uh, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share what we know. Just so, so thankful. Um, while I wrap things up here, Sharon, because of this feedback situation, would you mind just um, going over uh, at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side and clicking mute? That might solve some of the conflict. Let me see if that's... Huh, I guess it's on my end. I can fix it. Excuse me, everybody. Um, again, Sharon, thank you for your time. On behalf of the BU Alumni Association, I also want to thank all of our guests for participating. I want to thank you who've donated to be in BU in the past. We literally wouldn't be able to go on for without your support. Um, I want to let everybody know we've got eight more webinars coming up just in the month of March alone as part of our Alumni Career Weeks series. Um, during the month of March, our entire staff is dedicated to making sure that alumni have access to career networking opportunities, professional development, like this. We actually have 50 plus events online in cities around the world. Uh, and I hope that you all take a look at the schedule of events that are coming up. You can just go to www.bu.edu slash career week. Uh, you can sign up for our remaining webinars uh, just like this. I also want to mention, uh, again, Sharon has done some prison, uh, presenting for us before. Make sure you check out our online webinar archive at our website at bu.edu slash alumni and check out the uh, webinar that she did for us previously. It's also a really great link.
Um, and as always, and if you are any BU alumni you know would be interested in, in offering a solution like this, I'll ask you to please contact me at the Office of Alumni Relations or by email at jgmurphy at bu.edu. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Have a great day or a great evening, wherever you might be here.